Hi everyone, welcome to the first of this week's two mini sessions. In this first one, I'll be talking about effect sizes. So to get us going, um, I'm gonna take you back to some of the output that we got from an analysis in the Between Participants ANOVA lecture. And particularly, this is the main ANOVA table from a two-way Between Participants ANOVA, in which we had two independent variables, in-group status and audience. We noted that we had a significant main effect of uh, status, a non-significant main effect of audience, and also that the interaction between them was also not quite significant. And I noted that this is how you would write up that particular result, the interaction in APA format. So we have the numerator and denominator degrees of freedom, the F ratio and the P value. Now one particular part of that output and that write-up that I didn't highlight at the time was this last number here. Okay, Now that's the partial eta squared, Okay, the Greek letter eta, p for partial and yeah, squared in superscript. Okay, And we get that value from the last column of the output here, partial eta squared, uh, and 0 0.06 in this case. And we got that because uh, by default in Jamovi, this option here is automatically ticked partial eta squared. It's also possible to ask for eta squared, the non-partial eta squared, which will make a little bit more sense uh, a bit later in this lecture, and a number of other possible effect sizes too. Okay, so making sure that option is selected, which it is by default, gives you that partial eta squared column in your ANOVA output. So what is it? What is partial eta squared? Well, it's a measure of the size of a given effect. So how are effect sizes different from p-values? Often the p-value is the first place that we're trained to look as we're starting out with statistics um, to gauge whether something is you know, worth looking at further. Well, let's think about in, uh, more precisely what a p-value actually tells us. Um, it tells us the probability that you would have observed the data that you observed or more extreme if there was no true effect, if the effect didn't actually exist, if there was no true population effect. In other words, it's the probability that you would have, have obtained your data or more extreme data if the null hypothesis of zero effect were true. In contrast, effect sizes give you an indication of the magnitude or the size of a given effect. Okay. So while the p-value is, tell is telling you something about uh, the probability of your data in relation to a null hypothesis, if it were true, uh, the effect size is telling you about the size of that effect. Okay. Um, and unlike a p-value, effect size indicators can be used to say something about the importance as opposed to the significance in a, in a strict statistical sense. It can tell you about the importance of an effect in terms of explaining a dependent variable. So why are effect sizes important? Um, well, again, it, it's helpful to think about that uh, partly in relation to some of the limitations or features of p-values uh, by comparison. So for any given size of effect, um, a p-value will change as a function of sample size. So it's possible, for example, for very small and potentially very trivial and practically meaningless effects to become significant in the statistical sense, according to p-values, in very large samples in which you have uh, very high levels of statistical power. Um, conversely, of course, you can have maybe non-trivial effects turning out to be non-significant with uh, p-values less than 0 0.05, if that's your cutoff, uh, when your sample size is particularly small. In contrast, effect size measures are, uh, in principle, unaffected by sample size. Now this is very important because it allows us to do a number of things. Firstly, it allows us a basis, or gives us a basis for comparison of effects across several different studies. And in particular, studies that may not be you know, identical in terms of design. So studies maybe vary in terms of their sample size or the significance values. In terms of comparing them or uh, maybe synthesizing them uh, in terms of evidence, uh, we would do so in terms of the effect size because that, that's unaffected 
by things like the sample size in an individual study. Uh, effect sizes uh, also give us a basis for formal statistical synthesis of evidence across, of quantitative evidence across many different studies in a process or a procedure called meta-analysis, okay, which is uh, basically taking a lot of, rather than doing an original study, you perhaps look at a number of already published studies and synthesize that to get an overall estimate of the effect. And the key uh, ingredient in that is the effect size. It also allows us to make a judgment through power calculations, power analysis, about the sort of sample size that we might need to find an effect in a study that we're planning in the future. So uh, a key aim of this session uh, is to tie in with the data tutorial that's also available to you on Ellie regarding how to run power analysis. Okay, So a key ingredient of power analysis is the size of effect that you expect or you hope that you might find, that you think might be out there. So all of those features of effect sizes mean that, I mean, various different sort of foundational figures in statistics um, emphasize something sort of quite striking. So uh, here's a quote from Gene Glass, who, who developed the principles and practice of meta-analysis. So he says that statistical significance is perhaps the least interesting thing about the results that you might obtain from an analysis. Instead, you should describe the results in terms of measures of magnitude, effect size, not just does a treatment affect people, but how much does it affect them. Likewise, uh, Jacob Cohen, who's, who's responsible for our thinking about uh, effect sizes and about statistical power, um, he says something very similar. The primary product of a research inquiry is one or more measures of effect size, not p-values. Okay. So if we want to say something about the magnitude of an effect or the size of the evidence that we have, uh, to quantify the size of evidence that we have, it's effect sizes that give that, give that to us rather than p-values. And that's reflected in best practice guidance by the APA Task Force on Statistical Inference, who say very clearly, when we report the outcomes of statistical tests, our primary outcomes always present effect sizes as far as possible. So um, I might have convinced you that effect sizes are very important to consider and to report. Um, now, one of the things that as you get into the world of effect sizes becomes very clear, there are many different types or measures of effect size. And I'm gonna run through three broad sort of categories of effect size type. Um, the first one is uh, refers to a, 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 a set or a cluster of effect size measures that estimate the amount of variance accounted for in an outcome variable by an effect. So this, these can broadly be, when you see a, an effect size value of this kind, you can broadly understand it as a proportion. So it might typically vary between zero and one, where uh, that value corresponds to a percentage of explained variance. So an effect size of 0 0.03 might suggest that th the, the effect um, explains 3% of the variance in your outcome. An effect size of 0.37 explains 37% and so on. So examples of this type of effect size measure um, include things that you will have come across already. So R squared, as you will have seen it in uh, regression already, um, it also comes up in ANOVA, and it can also be calculated in correlation. So R squared is an indicator of effect size, an indicator of the amount of variance explained or accounted for um, in a statistical sense, but in an outcome variable. Um, eta squared and partial eta squared, uh, which usually crop up in the context of ANOVA, so they're, they're, they're by far, particularly partial eta squared is by far the most commonly reported effect size measure for ANOVA. Likewise, they are, broadly speaking, um, indicators of proportion of amount of variance explained. Um, other variations in that in ANOVA are um, omega squared, which I'll come on to in a little bit, and a Cohen's F squared as well, which you might see reported in conjunction with analysis of variance. The second broad category of effect size type are uh, known as, or can be thought of as standardized effect sizes. So a key example here is a standardized difference between two means. Uh, 
So whenever you see t-tests reported in the literature, it's, it's quite common, or it should be common, to see an effect size in the form of Cohen's D and or Hedge's G used in conjunction with that. So in terms of interpreting a Cohen's D, a standardized effect size measure of a difference between two means, um, uh, what it does is it quantifies a difference in terms of standard deviations. So if the effect size is one, if D equals one, then it means the means, these two means, differ by one standard deviation. If the D is 0.7, then it means they differ by 0.7 standard deviations and so on. Um, I've included a link here. I'm not going to open it now, uh, but uh, if you have access to the slides, uh, click here and it will give you a very useful spreadsheet of um, variations uh, of Cohen's D depending on the type of t-test that you run. Now another standardized uh, effect size measure that you will have come across already is uh, the beta coefficient, the standardized regression coefficient. Now that's usually used in conjunction with uh, individual predictors in regression. So it gives us uh, a sense of the, um, uh, the size of the correspondence or the association between a predictor and an outcome variable in regression. Um, although um, a partial R uh, is, is also quite commonly used as an effect size measure in regression too. Um, there'll be more on that in the context of the uh, regression session coming up after this one. The third type of effect size measure um, that you might come across in the literature um, are effect sizes associated with effects on categorical outcome variables. So whereas uh, the previous two types are broadly used where in analyses where outcome variables are measured on a continuous scale or perhaps ordinal, um, for categorical outcome variables, effect size measures might uh, include a, an odds ratio. So an odds ratio um, gives you an indication of um, the likelihood that an outcome will be one category or another given a unit increase in a predictor. So what that means, slightly more concretely, let's say we're interested in the effect of alcohol consumption, or um, so long-term alcohol consumption, on um, the likelihood of having or not having liver disease. Okay, So if the odds ratio of that is 2.3, what it means is that an additional unit of alcohol, however that's assessed, increases the odds of contracting liver disease by 2.3 times. Okay, So it's the odds of being in one category of the outcome relative to another given a unit increase in a predictor. Now that's most frequently used or seen in conjunction with techniques like logistic regression. Now because that uh, involves categorical outcome variables, it's a, a technique or set of techniques that I won't be covering in this lecture series. But it is something that in your broader reading uh, in psychology, you may well come across. Okay. Now, um, one of the reasons for giving you that very brief overview of all the different types of effect size measure that are available and, and, and you might encounter is that um, I, I want to emphasize a really critical thing is that effect size measures vary in terms of the range and meaning of their values. So let's think about the variance accounted for measures like R squared or eta squared. Those cannot be greater than one and they cannot be less than zero. So they will only ever range between zero and one. Okay. Um, in contrast though, um, standardized effect size measures such as Cohen's D um, those in practical terms can go well above one, they can go above two and indeed above three or indeed even higher in theory, although that's that's often very implausible. Um, so what that means is, um, well even uh, even actually variance accounted for measures aren't, aren't directly equivalent. So there are, um, so if you see a, a Cohen's F squared, that's that's not always directly translatable into a uh, an eta squared, at least not without um, some sort of conversion first. Okay. So the key thing here is that if, if you see a given value for an effect size, um, what was the effect size? 0.2. Okay. An effect size of 0.2 has a very different meaning depending on what type of effect size measure it is. An effect, uh, a Cohen's D of 0.2 is small, whereas uh, an R uh, of 
uh, or uh, an eta squared of 0.2 is, uh, is pretty large. Okay, that'll be pretty substantial, much larger than you would typically see in, in many areas of psychology. Um, so when you say um, the effect size was a given number, it's very, very important to say or know what type of effect size it is that you're talking about in order to make sense of that value. So um, to help you sort of navigate moving from one type of effect size to another for a given value and, and how you can convert one to the other, I've included a couple of links here and here. Again, I'm not gonna go into them now, but they're available to you by clicking on the links in the slides. Okay. So on to how we should interpret effect sizes. So what's a big effect size or a small effect size or a medium effect size? Now that is a, I just wanna say from the off, it's, it's, a, it's a controversial and vexed topic. Um, and the cutoffs or our notions of what constitutes small, medium or large effects um, come largely from uh, Cohen's quite hesitant and almost reluctant um, suggestion for cutoffs for small, medium and large effects um, according to particular effect sizes. So Cohen suggested that, well, if we're talking about a Cohen's D, then uh, a small effect uh, is anything uh, maybe about 0.2 or above. Uh, when you hit 0.5, you're talking about a medium sized effect and a Cohen's D of 0.8 indicates a large effect. Uh, in terms of an R, okay, a uh, small effect might be 0 0.1, 0 0.3 for medium, 0.5 for large. And for an eta squared, which you might see in between participants' analysis of variance, we have maybe a small value of 0 0.01, a medium size effect might be 0 0.06, and a large effect 0.14 or higher. Okay. Now, he didn't really say that much about repeated measures analysis of variance, which I know we haven't covered in this module, but it is, um, it's useful to think about it, especially if you're reading about it in the literature uh, or reading studies that report repeated measures analysis of variance. Um, Bakeman went on to formalize um, uh, cutoffs or suggested guidelines for um, uh, eta squared or generalized eta squared values for repeated measures ANOVA. So it suggests that a small uh, effect size would be a 0.02, uh, a medium eta squared our generalized eta squared is 0.13 and a large generalized eta squared 0.26. Okay. Um, now the, the one thing that will be that I just want to stress now is that uh, especially as this session is coming after the session on repeated measures using mixed models, mixed models there isn't really a widely established or you know th there isn't consensus about how and what we should report in terms of effect sizes for individual effects, individual parameters in a mixed model analysis. Which is why if you look back over that session, we don't have effect size measures associated with each effect. Okay, So um, there are suggestions out there for the sorts of things that, that could be reported, uh, a pseudo R squared, for example, but that is still, yeah, th there's, there's much less consensus about effect sizes for mixed models compared to, uh, say, uh, t-tests, correlations and regressions, or between participants, ANOVA. Okay. Now, thinking back to, to these suggested cutoffs for what you know, small or medium and large might mean in terms of different effect sizes. Now, the, the key thing to emphasize here, and it's something that Cohen himself emphasized, is that these are ultimately arbitrary. Um, they have very little absolute basis. Um, and indeed, the, the conventions about what we should regard as small, medium or large, or indeed meaningful or not meaningful, will probably vary quite a bit as a function of our research area, the research methods that we use, etc. Okay, so although it's quite common to see reference to these small, medium and large cutoffs with a reference to Cohen, Cohen himself emphasized that these are arbitrary, okay, and don't inherently carry meaning. Now, let's go back and consider effect sizes uh, as they relate to analysis of variance and dig down into where we actually get our effect size estimate from. So let's think first of all about uh, the eta squared. Now, I'm not talking here about the partial eta squared. I'm talking about eta squared without the P, the, the non-partial eta squared. 
So where does that come from? Now I've ticked that extra option in Jamovi to get this output. Okay, so I've now got eta squared as well as partial eta squared. Eta squared um, simply comes from uh, dividing the amount of variance accounted for by a particular effect, okay, by the total sums of squares. All right. So it is fairly straightforwardly the proportion of the variance, the total variance in the DV associated with a particular effect. So thinking about the effective status here, we have a sums of squares of 8.42, total sums of squares of 131.55, divide this by this, and that gives you 0 0.06, and that's your eta squared, okay, for status. So that's where eta squared comes from. Okay. Now the problem with eta squared uh, and why it's partial eta squared that we tend to use is that eta squared of an effect automatically decreases as further variables or effects are added to the model. So as our, as our model becomes more complex, um, the eta squared of a given effect will decrease. So a solution to that is that uh, we use a partial eta squared um, rather than the eta squared. So what a partial eta squared does is it removes or partials out the variance in the outcome explained by the other effects in the model. Okay. So what that in principle does, the advantage that that gives us is that it allows us to compare effects, the size of an effect or variable across studies that have a different design. So uh, just thinking again about status, partial eta squared in principle lets us compare the size of the effect of status across a study that just looks at status and a study that looks at status and audience and a study that looks at status and audience and threat. Okay. Now, in terms of the formula, it's a little bit different than the normal eta squared. Okay, the partial eta squared is again the sums of squares of the effect in question, but this time it's divided by the sums of squares of the effect plus the error sums of squares. Okay, so in this denominator now, we're not including the sums of squares um, associated with other effects in the model. Okay, so let's see that in practice. So now we are dividing the sums of squares by status, of status, not by the total, but by this value plus this value. Okay, so it's 8.42 divided by 117.24 plus 8.42. Okay, and that gives us 0 0.07 as we see here. All right, so that's where the partial eta squared comes from. Now there are two caveats to that. Um, and I should say um, that, again, partial eta squared is, is by miles the most widely reported effect size measure in ANOVA. Um, but there's, there's a couple of important things to remember about it. Um, firstly is that it is biased in a particular sense. So what it does is it technically estimates the size of the effect in our sample rather than the size of the effect in the population. And in fact, it typically overestimates the true population effect. In other words, whatever effect we're observing in our sample, it's, uh, or effect size we're observing in our sample, it's usually smaller in the population as a whole. In other words, our, our, our sample estimated effect size is probably bigger than the one that's really out there. So that's why um, people are increasingly recommending some alternatives um, such as omega squared or epsilon squared. Uh, now there's further discussion here, again, something I'm not going to go into right now, but if you're interested in the relative merits of these different effect size measures, do click on here. Um, and uh, yeah, so via the slides. Okay. Now a second big caveat is that effect sizes don't vary, as I said earlier, they don't vary as a function of sample size. Okay, But effect size measures for a given study will vary as, function, as a function of different features of the method that you have used. Okay, The size of an effect, of uh, the observed size of an effect, depends, for example, on how variables are operationalized. So, for instance, um, the effect size of a variable will be bigger if you have um, manipulated that in a particularly strong way compared to a not very strong way. We can have weak or strong manipulations of the variable 
and that will be reflected in the observed effect size for a given outcome. Um, it may also be affected by, or your effect size will also be sensitive to, things like um, the sensitivity and the relevance of your outcome measures. Um, if, for example, we are looking at uh, or measuring the outcome variable six months after a manipulation compared to immediately after a manipulation, it may not be particularly sensitive. So if we've measured our outcome variable way, you know, ages after the manipulation, the observed effect size is much likely, uh, much more likely to be smaller. Okay, um, whatever effect the manipulation had will have diluted, okay, or dissipated over time. So, um, just thinking about this uh, in in methodological terms. All right, let's let's give a concrete example. If I'm interested in the effect of um, the effect of perceptions of illegitimacy or unfairness on people's willingness to complain about something, to take uh, sort of collective action against what they perceive to be an injustice. Now, I might want to manipulate um, perceptions of unfairness. So what I might do is um, create or, or write a, an imagined scenario. So people read a scenario, uh, an imagined scenario, and we compare their responses um, a, you know, an imagined scenario of something unfair happening, um, say, you know, a, a name calling or something, and we compare that to a control condition in which they don't receive any information, they don't read a scenario. Now, in the grand scheme of things, that's quite, um, that's quite a mild and benign form of uh, unfairness. Now, if, um, if ethics and, and logistics and cost were no obstacle at all, if we were completely ruthless, then we could we could actually manipulate um, unfairness or perceived unfairness in much much stronger ways. We could uh, we could engage in sustained name calling, a, a, um, a sustained campaign of bullying. We could um, beat somebody up. Now those are those are completely beyond the pale, of course. But what they are are much stronger ways of operationalizing uh, our independent variable. Okay. And uh, compared to a control condition, the effect size of our variable illegitimacy or unfairness will be much stronger than it was if we had used that much more benign way of operationalizing that variable. Okay, so key message here, effect sizes don't vary per se according to sample size, but they will vary as a function of how you operationalize your study. Okay, that's it for effect sizes. Uh, next time uh, in the second mini session associated with this week, I will start to reintroduce uh, regression, uh, in particular going over simple and multiple linear regression. All right, uh, take care and uh, see you for session two.